So, thank you, Dixie, for reading. It just meant that people had five minutes less of listening to me. But we've got quite a meaty chapter going on with chapter two of Acts. And so the start of this talk comes with a bit of a health warning that I'm not going to try and attempt to get everything you could possibly get out of Acts 2, because if we did, we'd still be here in about three weeks' time. So hopefully we'll get an idea of what's going on, some big picture ideas, and some takeaways that we can run with. We're going to start with reality, because as we come into Acts 2, the reality is that they and they being the believers, the disciples, plus women, including Mary, Jesus' mother, and also his brothers, they were all together in one place. We've probably got a few other believers as well, because the figure of 120 is mentioned, so actually, you're gonna have to go quite a long way from the 12 disciples together. And the reality for them at the beginning of Acts 2 is that they are waiting. So in chapter one, I don't know um, whether you've done chapter one or whether you're going straight in here. Serena might be about to nod at me. Straight in here, that's absolutely fine. That's what I thought. So in chapter one, um, if you've read it, if not, you might want to read it later. You can get the backstory. But we heard how the believers had been told by Jesus to wait in Jerusalem for the gift that God had promised. And this gift was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit had been promised to them. Did those people know what they were going to expect? Did they know what it was going to entail when the Holy Spirit came? No. Did they have any idea? I suspect not really. Um, they knew they were waiting. They were being obedient. They were doing what they were told. And I think they were probably waiting for another person to walk in a bit like Jesus had done. I think that's what I would have been waiting for. But the group was together and they were waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. And while that happened, they Pentecost came. And it's been termed Pentecost as an afterthought um, because of what happened. But actually, they were gathered in Jerusalem and loads and loads of people were gathered in Jerusalem because there was a Jewish festival happening at this time. And it was called the Festival of Weeks, which sounds a little bit random to us. But it was when people came to Jerusalem to offer the first fruits of the harvest. So literally, the first um, items that had grown in the wheat harvest. It was a thanks offering for all the produce that would literally keep them alive. So Jerusalem was packed with people who wouldn't usually be there. People who came from all different cultures and spoke all different languages. And so they've been waiting. I think if this, this group here there's a lot less of you than 120. But if you've just been told to wait, there'd probably be quite a lot of talk of why. Why are we waiting? What are we waiting for? Who are we waiting for? Probably not much time before there's sort of a bit of restless and a bit grumbly of, oh, why are we still waiting? When, when are we going to get what we're waiting for? So I just want you to imagine for a second how many of you have been camping? You can go for a show of hands if you want to. Okay, so a fair few of you. How many of you have camped in strong winds? <laughs> Who actually enjoys that? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I love camping. I um, always have done. I used to go camping a lot when I was a child, and I still do now. But when I was a kid, um, I was probably about 10, we went out one evening from the campsite, um, and we came back, and the tent wasn't there. Or rather, it wasn't where we left it. It was a crumpled mess about 100 metres up the field because there were strong winds. Um, and I think probably from that point on, I've always been quite wary of strong winds, especially if you're not expecting them, you're in a tent, or you're inside and you don't want the wind to be inside with you. Because that's what happened in this reading, isn't it? A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. It wasn't that they heard it from the outside and thought, oh, it's a bit rough out there, I'm going to stay in here. This was that actually, this was in the house with them. And we have the luxury of being told that that sound came from heaven, 
But at the time, if you were one of those believers sat in that house, how do you think you would have felt? And then it kind of gets a bit weirder, perhaps the same level of weird as crazy wind in the house when you're not expecting them. But tongues of fire came to rest on each of them. And at that point, I can imagine it was awe inspiring. I can imagine it was also potentially terrifying and very strange. However, these signs that we've heard about didn't happen in isolation because all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. So I'm just going to stop there for a second. Some of you might have experienced something verging on this, probably not the roaring wind or the actual kind of tongues of fire. But you might have been in a situation where you've experienced the Holy Spirit fall. And it might have been awe inspiring. It might have been a bit terrifying because you didn't know what was going on. But for those believers, I truly believe that they would have known that it was the Holy Spirit. They would have known that it was the gift that their friend and teacher and Lord, that Jesus had promised them. And so that would have taken over with any fear that was going on. So I'm not here, and um, probably many of you would breathe a sigh of relief, but I'm not here to give a detailed talk about the gift of tongues tonight. But at this point, in this um, account of what we're hearing, the Holy Spirit enabled believers to do, to speak in tongues, to speak, how, and then for a very specific purpose in this passage. The gift's not limited to that, but that's for another time. But in this context, it serves a particular purpose. Because I think we can assume from what we hear next in the passage that the sound like the rushing wind wasn't restricted to just inside the building. It wasn't just where the believers were. And that when they were speaking in tongues, they were speaking in these other languages, and that's what I'm at the moment terming as speaking in tongues, that they were whispering. Because those outside the house the place where they were, they heard what was going on. So Jerusalem was full of people celebrating this festival of weeks. And they were Jews from all over, from all, um, every nation under heaven, is what it says in the passage. So they were confused and a bit sort of bewildered, because they wouldn't have expected to hear their own language. Not, not unless they were with people who come with them, if you see what I mean. Because the people who were speaking were from Galilee, that region in um, Israel, they shouldn't be speaking naturally those languages. And unsurprisingly, the other Jews who were gathered around outside had heard their languages being spoken. It wasn't just random things that they heard, but they heard the believers praising God, declaring the wonders of God in languages that they could understand. And yet people being people, instead of sort of everybody being amazed and a bit perplexed in a good way, some people assumed they were drunk. I'm a bit curious as to how they thought that people who were drunk could speak foreign languages fluently, but hey ho, um, it is what's being recorded. But just let's wait a second here both for us hearing this now, but also for the first readers, for the first, um, those people who experienced this firsthand. What do you think they were thinking? How do you feel when you hear all of this? What do you think would have been going on for them then? And so our next point is reason. So why, what was going on? What was happening? What was the reason for it? So Peter, along with the other disciples, stands up and addresses this crowd that has gathered. And he's setting the record straight. He's clarifying that they weren't drunk at nine o'clock in the morning. And he explains what actually was going on. Because Peter is well aware that what has just happened needs explanation. So Peter refers back to what many of us would know as the Old Testament. But for those hearers then, he was referring back to their scriptures, their Jewish scriptures. Because those who'd gathered 
for Jews, they knew these scriptures well. And Peter directly quotes from Joel chapter 2, and the verses that he uses explain what has just happened. Joel, in, in that scripture that Peter is referring back to, is foretelling how God will pour his spirit out on all people. Men and women, young and old, slave and free, no one is excluded. And it will be signs and wonders from heaven. And that, in a nutshell, is what they've just seen. But Peter doesn't leave it there. Instead, he summarises the gospel in the following kind of three verses. So I'm just going to read, sort of pull those, the things of what's going on. So chapter, um, in verse 22, 23 and 24, we hear the points that Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God by miracles, wonders and signs, and that was God doing those things through Jesus. And then Jesus was handed over and put to death by nailing him to the cross. But it didn't end there. God raised him from the dead. So Peter's grounding his message, his explanation, in more of the scriptures. Again, things that his um, hearers would have been familiar with. And this time he quotes from Psalms. And again, just in a few short verses, he explains the next part of the good news, the next part of the gospel. So he, he names Jesus as the Messiah. And he talks about the importance that it didn't end with the crucifixion, rather that God raised Jesus to life. And that actually many of these people had witnessed this. And then he goes further and said how Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God. And then he received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. And it was that Holy Spirit that had been poured out on these people here and now. And then he really lands it with verse 36. He's addressing, he's addressing that crowd, all the people who are listening by their combined names, their Israelites, their people of Israel. And he just says, God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter has explained what has happened. He's rooted his message in the scriptures that they'll understand. He's kept it simple and short and to the basics. There's no need to, for him to get too flowery or too lawfully. He didn't go on and on and on about it. And he's addressed them by their name, by their collective group. He's speaking directly to them. And that was summed up in that verse 36. But a response is needed. So where do you feel that you're at, having heard all of that? What do you think they would have thought when those first hearers had heard from Peter? all those years ago. They have a question and they ask Peter, what shall we do? They were convicted that they needed to do something. They knew they needed to do something, but they didn't necessarily know what that something was. So Peter gives a really straightforward answer with really clear steps. Repent and be baptised. Repent, turn away from what it is that you were doing where you were going, and rather turn towards Jesus and be baptised. It was an outward sign of what was going on in their hearts. And he says that to every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. That's why they were doing it, to be forgiven, once they turned away and repented. And then what happens? then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not you might, or if it's a good day, you will. It's the, if you repent, you're baptised, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But Peter's message did require a response. They had to actually decide whether or not they wanted to repent and be baptised. 
And it's the same with any presentation of the gospel. A response is always needed. So we hear that about 3,000 people accepted that message, were baptised and added to the number of people who professed Christ that day. It's amazing. The church was born at Pentecost. It grew amazingly in number. And from that point on, this amazing pouring out of God's Holy Spirit is looked back upon as the birth of the church as we know it. So what we also see, and it's probably easy to ignore, but I think it's important that we don't ignore, is that well, there were others who didn't receive the message that day. They'd all heard exactly the same thing. And it isn't recorded as to how many people that was. But it says that Peter pleaded with his hearers and spoke with them again to save themselves. Those who accepted. So it's clear that there were those who sadly didn't. You may know that saying, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Well, that's what's happening here. That's what always happens with the presentation of the gospel. But Peter played his part. He told people the good news. He explained it to them in an accessible way that they could understand. But not everyone is willing to accept it. And while Peter talked and pleaded with them, in the end he couldn't make people accept the message. And nor should he. God's timing is right, but God's timing isn't necessarily comfortable or easy, as I'm pretty sure we probably all know. It might be that some of these people who hadn't been able to accept the message then did so at a later date. But that's between them and God. It's not our responsibility to force someone to accept the good news. But if this message is news to you tonight and you want to make a response, please do come and chat to me or to whoever invited you and get some more information about what that can look like. But this is all grounded in real life, and both real life for those people then and for us now. So when we're reading through Acts 2, it can always seem as we're getting to the end of that chapter, like there's a bit of a change of topic when we hit verse 42. In the NIV translation, it's got the subheading of the Fellowship of Believers. And then we have like these five verses at the end which sort of feel a little bit like they're tacked on to the end of the Pentecost narrative. However, they're there for a reason in that particular place. And what we see in those verses, instead of a change of topic, is rather a moving on to where the believers now were. A new reality, a new way of life. It was their now new lived reality in response to what had happened at Pentecost. A new way of doing life as a church as a community of believers. So we're shown and given a model for life as a community of believers. When I was um, a bit older than most of you probably are now, I was in a home group in Cardiff with a church that I was part of, and we were studying Acts. And I remember discussing this model at the end of Acts with a friend of mine. And we had quite a heated discussion because he was adamant that it wasn't sort of doable in this day and age, where I was adamant that it was. And I stand by that. Um, not identically, we are in a different culture, in a different time and place. But I think there are so many principles that we can act upon from this. And from that point on, these verses have been some of my favourite in the Bible, and just really special to me. But I think we can learn so much from them. And they're so key to an effective Christian life. So for those of you who've been around Christian communities, normally churches, for a while, many of the things that we sort of hear mentioned and listed will be really familiar. So the model of life that the collective believers were embracing included teaching, hearing from those who've been anointed to teach the scriptures, fellowship to encourage and build each other up, what you've got here, breaking of bread, following the pattern that Jesus taught his disciples on the night he was betrayed, and prayer, talking to God, our Heavenly Father, individually and in groups. And everyone was filled with awe at the signs and wonders the apostles were performing. And they were only performing those through the power of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't them doing something special on the human level. But why were they doing that? The awe part is probably fairly self-explanatory that if you're seeing signs and wonders, perhaps people being healed or set free, 
but actually those things are awe-inspiring. And on the day of Pentecost, what was the purpose of the wind and the tongues of fire and people speaking in those different languages? They were dramatic manifestations of the Holy Spirit and they pointed to God's power and authority. And people were blessed as a response. People came to know God and Jesus as a response. So going forward, signs and wonders performed by the apostles would be performing the same purpose. They'd be pointing to God and his power. The believers were all together. They had everything in common. Yes, let's just sink that in to where we're at. They were all together and they had everything in common. Not that they had their own, like, I don't know, food in the cupboard or their own wallet for the money, but they felt like it was totally theirs. It was all held in common. And yes, they probably would have had individual belongings. But there was a communal nature to things that meant that nobody went without. It might actually be easier for many of you to grasp that concept than perhaps people who are a bit older, like me, who kind of live a more kind of compartmentalised life. Because I guess many of you will probably see each other on a daily basis. You may well be in and out of each other's homes and sort of eating together and studying together. But I think that's what we're what we're having described to us, that there were less barriers. Yes, life was different back then, it was more localised, but this was still very different to the cultural norms. And why? Why was it? Why was this important? Because people shared, and as a consequence, everyone had enough. There were no needy people among them. And they shared beyond the biological family structure. And behaving this way, they created a new community which acted like a family, but without the biological bonds. So it's like they found a new family. They formed a new family in Jesus. It was bound together by Jesus. And then the technical term for this, if anybody is interested, it's called a fictive kin group. But it's really important because of what they were doing. And it was countercultural. So they were a living, breathing, active, worshipping family community. They ate together. They worshipped God together. Natural thing to do in your new grouping. But this fueled them to continuing to live life as believers and to spread the good news. And so I think that's why this comes where it does. It's been placed here at the end of the Pentecost narrative because it's a natural progression. It's how they did life and how they were fueled to continue in this lifestyle together. But it goes further. It also demonstrates important things of those who are around them. Just like the God-given ability to speak in different languages at Pentecost, that demonstrated and spoke to those around them. This new way of life led them to enjoy the favour of the people. They were regarded highly, they were respected, and as a consequence, people would listen to them. And people around them would want to know why they live so differently to other people. Why had they chosen this? Why were they living for others, not just for them and their family? And this would have been appealing to those who were around them. Can you imagine if you were um, somebody not in this community who was really struggling and didn't have enough to live by, who'd been left out on the edges, and you saw that in this community, that didn't happen to anybody. It was extraordinary with Jesus at the centre of all they did. And as a consequence of this lifestyle, the Lord added daily to their number those who were being saved. And it was all down to God. God enabled them to live like that. And God added to, to their number. The way we live our lives, are, it's vitally important sometimes more so than the words we say. Especially if our lives don't reflect what we say, because people notice. And I'm not talking about being joyful all the time and saying everything's okay when it's not. That's really not where I'm at. But what I'm talking about is saying one thing and then demonstrating a completely different thing where your actions 
because people will notice and know that there is a discrepancy. So it's worth thinking about what our communities reflect to those around us and how they can be appealing to those around us. In a culture where community is so often lacking, sharing a simple meal together, as many of you I know were doing last year, last term in impact groups, can be really, really special. So as we come into land, what do we learn from Acts 2? In a nutshell, quite a lot, I'd say, <laughs> that waiting and obedience are important. The Holy Spirit is for all believers, and the Holy Spirit equips us to share the good news. When signs and wonders happen, there may, may need to be some level of explanation in order for people to understand what's happening. I'm not saying you need to be able to explain sort of X, Y, and Z, because God is beyond our understanding. But you might need a level of, when God's Holy Spirit comes, sometimes X can happen, and that's okay. I see the next point as a very good thing. The gospel can be told in very few words. I think Peter managed a very comprehensive account in about six short verses. And the good news is for everyone. There's no barriers to people. There's no nobody who's not, not able to hear it. But it requires a response. And that response is not the responsibility of the person giving the account. It's between the hearer and God. We're given this amazing model of how a fellowship of believers, how a Christian community can look, which should be different to the culture around us. But it's different in all sorts of good and appealing ways, which mean that some people, not all, but all people necessarily, but will be attracted to it and want to be part of it. And it's always the Lord who adds to our number. And praise God for that. Amen.